Hey, what's going on? I'm DJ Sixsmith. You're watching The Sit Down. Brand new docu-series. Absolutely fascinating. It's from these guys right here. Paul Pulaski, Mike McGinnis. What's up, guys? Hey, how are you? Good to meet you. Yeah, to meet thank you for having us. You got it. So, Leavenworth, people obviously see this name. They'll think about the penitentiary in Kansas. And mm -hmm. when they hear the name Clinton Lorenz, they'll obviously think about a lot of different things. So, let's start with you, Paul. How did this whole thing come together? And, and what was it like unpacking many different parts of Clint's story, Mike's story, and just the, the Army in general? Well, um, an associate early on um, introduced me to the family and specifically the legal team, you know, and, uh, you know, the story had gotten some notice and New York Times had written about it. Uh, David Phillips, who actually appears in the film, you know, had uh, said a couple things about it. So, uh, like most filmmakers, you're always looking for uh, an amazing story, a story with stakes, a story with relevance, and, you know, this had it all in spades, you know, to say the least. And as uh, you know, what seemed like a pretty simple and interesting concept, the more you peeled away the layers, the more there was there to things to be examined and uh, unpacked. So we were just diligent about trying to unpack all those things and, and really go straight to the voices and the, the people who had been there. And um, as we went down the line, you know, Mike and members of uh, First Platoon, uh, it was important to reach out to them as well and get their side of the story. So, um, you know, we knew we had an important story and, and, and a story that needed to be handled responsibly. So that, that was part of the process. And Mike, for you, it's obviously been years since all this went down in 2012, <laughs> but this is opening up a whole new wound for you. So what was it like unpacking this? And what was it like just going back to that point in your life? Well, I mean, I, I've talked to Paul and, and Fi and Dave and everybody that's involved in it. Um, you know, I told them if they would have had contacted me a year, year and a half earlier, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Mm. Um, you know, it's just a, it's a very surreal thing to sit there and talk about the worst day of your life over and over and over <laughs> again. Um, and then it's, you know, not just this is what happened, but you, you know, you're getting, they're asking specific questions, you know, uh, to get the details. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, I'm, I'd like to think that for the most of us uh, in the platoon, you know, we are in better spots now and it, it is a little easier to talk about. Uh, you know, we still think what we did was right, mm -hmm. but it, the, like, I guess the visceral feelings that we originally had, you know, have kind of, uh, you know, lessened, you know, where there's, we can look at it more contextual and, and with an even head. How long do you think it took you to get to that point? Oh, five or six years. Mm. <laughs> you know, like it's, you know, it wasn't easy. Uh, you know, I struggled a lot when I got home. Uh, you know, a lot of us did. And it just took me a long time to kind of get comfortable with myself and, and, you know, how I would characterize my service afterwards and uh you know there was a lot of you know anger towards uh you know lawrence and then like self-loathing on my hat you mm -hmm. know part like i didn't do enough to stop it or you know uh you know other thing you know just the long you know th feelings along that line and uh you know it took me a while to kind of not be angry about it you know and not be defined by it like not let it kind of rule my life yeah, and I think your platoon was really defined by this, unfortunately, and you guys obviously show that in the series. And starting with episode one, I mean, you, we learned all about Clint. We learned about his family. We learned about his sexuality. We learned about his time in the Army. What was most important to discover in that first episode? I mean, really just laying the groundwork for, okay, you're not dealing with, um, you know, two-dimensional people, or two-dimensional two, two things. You're dealing with people who have lives and, you know, uh, really a lot going on that informs them as people and making them three-dimensional and I identifiable to people. Uh, so really kind of just laying the groundwork for who these people are, including, you know, mm -hmm. you know Mike and the other guys that are in there. But um, I think, unfortunately, especially with things that are as polarizing as this, people want to reduce it to black and white. You know, it's either this or that. And, you know, the, the big part of it is, like, we really want to put context to all this mm -hmm. thing. You know, we really wanted people to be informed by the whole picture, not just what has been reduced down to talking points. So that, that process was Im important to kind of bring those things in. And there's a lot of very proprietary things that people will need to know to be able to watch the rest of the series. So we had to educate people a little bit in that first episode. So as we go along and the tempo picks up, they'll be able to understand it and not you know, get caught up in the lingo or get caught up on some details that they wouldn't know otherwise because a lot of people don't come to the table knowing all that stuff. Yeah, context is really key yeah. in this whole entire story. And Mike, even for you, I would imagine just watching Clinton, hearing him speak must be pretty interesting because 
Have you have you have one way of looking at him and it, one way that you felt? I mean, I I was mad at him for a long time. Uh, now, you know, I'm not saying I'm going to be friends with him, right. but I, I want him to have a good life. You know, I and whenever he's released, you know, and that he he can go out into the world and find something he's passionate about and he wants to do and somebody he cares about and and just has you know a genuinely good life. I don't wish him anything bad, but I don't ever want to speak to him again mm. you know um, but yeah it was it was different <laughs> to, to watch yeah. the whole thing you know and um, y y and just hear about because you know it, it was one situation and we we both lived it but we both see it differently I guess right uh, so like that that was interesting and it's pretty incredible that two guys can have two totally different perspectives about one particular incident. Yeah. And even just like the entire group, because when you think about the platoon, like you guys had your thing going on, Clint comes in, like how much of a factor is it like things aren't meshing in this initially? Because like he changes the rules of engagement, but how much of it was like you and your guys had this core group and then he comes into the picture? Like what was it like dealing with that initially? Well, that wasn't so much an issue for me uh, and a lot of the other NCOs because like lieutenants typically you're with them 18 months and then they move on. Right. Um, so like changeover, it's something that comes with being in the military. Um, we weren't happy with how, like Dom left, right. like you know, being wounded. We were worried about him, uh, but you know, we knew there would there would be another lieutenant. Uh, but you know, we had advocated for another lieutenant to come in. It didn't happen, and um, you know, it just uh, we wanted him to be part of the group. All of us did. Uh, it's just he had different ideas on how he should kind of get folded into mm -hmm. the group. I gotcha. Paul, when you think about Clint, he's obviously somebody that struggled with his family and those relationships. It seemed like, obviously, with being gay, that was a whole different factor as well. How much of it was an overcompensation and him trying to prove to these guys that he could hang and that he was tough enough and that he could do it for his family as well? You know, it's a question that he'd be better to answer. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I... I my responsibility is to put out what he says and let people kind of draw from that right. what they think. And, you know, for me to make any assumptions or offer up personal opinions would, you know, kind of do a uh, disservice. I, I, I wouldn't ever want anybody to ascribe um, to what I chose as a filmmaker to, you know, from personal, you know, feelings on things. But, uh, look, I, I think that part of his life is what, you know, it contributed to who he is as a person. So. Uh, the people who know him best, the people who interacted with him in those circumstances, you know, they're probably the best people to, to speak to that. Um, but, you know, certainly it was part of his life. Mm -hmm. And like all of us, our past experiences uh, inform who we are and how we conduct ourselves today and moving forward. Yeah, they shape and mold us, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. I think another really interesting part is when you think about all the different people in the docuseries. It's, it's people like Mike and Click who are on the ground. It's people like General Petraeus who are yeah. all the way at the top. How did you guys get General Petraeus? What was it like having that perspective? I mean, that must have been pretty fascinating. Well, you know, it was important to have that perspective because um, I think given how polarizing uh, the subject matter is, mm -hmm. and you have very strong opinions on both sides, and look, it, it, it has to be mentioned also that, like, you know, I think a lot of people are saying it's two sided. We also include the perspective of uh, Afghans yeah. uh, who are their family members. So um, I, I think. That was part of being responsible about it, but that was also part of painting a complete picture because they have very different opinions about the situation than you know Mike and and you know uh, Clint's family and Clint and you know everybody else. So uh, having a robust 360 uh, treatment of the whole thing was responsible. As far as uh, you know, General Petraeus, um, one of my producers, uh, you know, a good friend of mine, Feruz Albaz, uh, you know, she was amazing. And she and you know all, you know the rest of my crew. My my uh, my wife was a co EP on it, Sarah nice. Gerges, and very good friend David Check. You know was my, my showrunner and, and, and production partner. Everybody contributed. You know and you know uh, Feruz Fai, as as we lovingly uh, call her. She uh, she was the instrument to you know get to General Petraeus and uh, her father. You know was a famous geologist and and you know had like a lot of colleagues who were you know, uh, operating uh, as ambassadors and that kind of thing. So it was just a matter of using our context. But, but bottom line is she's just an amazing producer and I was really fortunate to have her uh, as part of the team. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You mentioned the Afghani people and I'd love to talk to you about just the relationship between you guys and 
the Afghani people that were there because like you guys met for tea. Like there there was yeah. some definitely some good vibes going on over there, but you're over there for war. So how would you describe that relationship? It was I don't want to say antagonistic, mm -hmm. but you know, when you're patrolling, you're not walking the roads. You're going over the grape, you know, the grape uh, rows. You're walking through the fields. So you're, you're, but you're tearing everything up. Like honestly, um, you know, so you have that kind of, like, it, it's an antagonistic thing for the Afghan people. Um, but the thing is, is if you can, you can show them that there's a reason we're doing this. Um, you know, that we're 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 trying to push the bad guys out, so you can just have a regular, you know way of life rather than having to deal with, you know, uh, uh, IDs mm -hmm. and, and, you know, gunfights right outside your house. Like, we wanted them to have uh, a normal way of living, you know, the best way we can. Um, and, you know, we were getting there, like, it, especially in southern Afghanistan, you know, family ties are everything. So us being the outsiders, you have to really work to earn that kind of trust. And, you know, we were slowly but surely chipping away at it. Uh, before everything happened, and uh, it's really unfortunate because I think we could have done some real good down there. Do you feel like there could have been 100% trust, just given everything? You know, as good as things were getting, was there still that thought in the back of your mind, like we're here and there's a lot well, of other things going on? The a Afghans are very pragmatic, and they've had to be. Like they've, right. they've lived in a country that's been at war since yeah, 1980. Forever. Yeah. You know, um, so they they know that they ha they have to play both sides, you know, to get whatever they need to survive. You know, so I mean, you're never gonna like 100% trust. But you can still have, you know, a good working relationship with them where, you know, they can, you know, feed you, you know, information or, uh, you know, maybe work with you on a, on a project to, to bring business to the village or, you know, dig a well, you know, things like that. So, and th those are always good. Those are always wins, you know. So, Definitely. Paul, for you, when people will see what happened in 2012 and they'll hear from Clint, they'll hear from Mike and the rest of the platoon, they will see certain things they may not have seen before. From a storytelling perspective, how did you guys decide to break that down and what was most interesting about unpacking the story? Um, well, you know, what I hope people will see from it is that, you know, they, um, you know, will be informed. And again, it's all about context. And, um, you know, what's most interesting is just, you know, finding those nuances and kind of getting to know the people involved in it. And, and like anybody, you know, you, walk into a situation and you walk into uh, a story with your own baggage and that kind of informs you know how you perceive things and I, and I imagine um, people will look at this as well and kind of judge what they see based on what their own experiences are um, you know, one, one thing that one film that I, I cited you know through this whole process when discussing with people and you know pitching it and it coming together uh, some colleagues of mine did a, uh, a film well, Jesus Camp a few years ago, and I thought they did an excellent job of uh, just letting people and people who were involved with the story speak, you know, their minds and, and tell their story and not add, add editorial or put your own spin on it. And, you know, truth is, uh, what was really telling about that and what I aspired to do uh, with Leavenworth was put that out there and whatever people are taking from it was really coming from what they have inside rather than what we're putting, you know, out there. Uh, so, and from the feedback that we got, I think we, we accomplished that. Mike, I know you've obviously talked about this day a number of times, but clearly there is a situation where Clinton's saying, anybody on a motorcycle, we're taking them out. You and the rest of the guys obviously didn't see eye to eye with that. And even throughout the docuseries, you're saying, like, if you get this order, don't listen to it necessarily. So. When did you start to sense that there were changes in the rules of engagement and that you also weren't cool with the changes yeah, in the rules of engagement? I mean, I wasn't fully aware that things had changed uh, until after everything happened, um, when like the investigation right. started in order. Um, but, you know, it's, it's hard enough being uh, an infantry guy. Like, mm -hmm. you're, that's your job. You run around, uh, you know, close with, engage, and destroy the enemy. That's the army you know, definition. Um, but, you know, you still have to have those, I don't know, uh, just because something's a rule doesn't mean it's, it's a good one, you know, type. Mm -hmm. that's how I felt about uh, some of the, like the engagement criteria, um, y you know, for to, to actually engage the enemy. But, um, m you know, I had a lot of guys that felt like I did, like we weren't there to put undue stress on the people, like that's the last thing we wanted to do. Right that would just completely negate all the good work we'd done. So, you know, 
yeah, we did get into firefights, but we made sure that it was more of a controlled application of force rather than just a, a reason to go shoot, you know. So, I mean, it's, we, we I don't want to say we bent and, and played with the rules of engagement, but we made sure that we utilized proper escalation of force before we, right. before we engaged. Yeah, and you guys were there to do a job. Yeah. And obviously things got very complicated and, and people start to talk and Clint comes home and it turns into this whole media circus. And you guys go back to the court where everything went down, which I'm sure mentally was a pretty insane situation for you guys. And Paul, you're telling the story of everything here. So when you think about the lawyer that was there for Clint, the family, like what was most fascinating in terms of that part of the story with the trial? Um, like all these things, there's two sides of it. So um, just allowing the family to kind of uh, you know, tell it from their perspective, but also relive it emotionally. Um, you know, it was a very strong thing. But also along the way, you know, the challenges associated with it, like you want to tell a story, you want to be efficient with your storytelling and not bog it down. You know, there's a lot to unpack even as we're telling that story. So finding ways to inform people while we're telling this was a challenge. But, you know, it was interesting, interesting to, to me and, you know, the rest of the team to see uh, how things were similar to the civilian system and you know how they digressed but um, again like any of these things um, you know we really had to provide balance and you know the family certainly asserted a lot of things about the original lawyer guy Womack mm -hmm. it's only fair to let the man have his Speak side of the story told as well I mean look probably borderline illegal to just make these assertions yeah. for us and, <laughs> and you know not at least give him the opportunity Absolutely. you know and we reached out to everybody you know we really made an attempt and some people didn't want to do it, which is understandable. Some people, and uh, yeah, look, I have to credit Womack for at least coming on because I, I imagine he probably knew that um, the people, uh, you know, who are telling their side of the story weren't going to be very kind uh, to uh, to you know his performance. So um, yeah, that process was just informative as uh, you know we heard them tell the story, and you know also kind of dive in to uh, you know talk about the mechanics of the military criminal justice system. We, you know, we did reach out to try to get, you know, folks from the prosecution, mm -hmm. but we're, you know, we're turned down. I don't I believe it has to do with, you know, army policy. Sure. But uh, so, you know, we found ourselves a, a proxy of sorts, um, a gentleman by the name of Eric Carpenter who teaches uh, um, law in Florida. And he was great, you know. He said, look, this is from the perspective, you know, he was former JAG, uh, and, and, you know, he said this is very likely uh, the Army's perspective, this is the court's perspective, this is what they would do, this is my assessment as if I were, you know, in the mix there. Uh, so that was important as well, but it was also informative. Yeah, totally. And so as a viewer, you know, Mike, I'm going along and watching this thing. It, it's Clint's situation, gives the order to kill, a couple guys get killed, and then out of nowhere, we come up with your incident and your situation, yeah. and then suddenly you're roped in with murder charges, mm -hmm. and that was like mind blown at the end of episode three there. So just walk me back to that point in your life and what the heck you were thinking. Well, you don't quite, <laughs> like the feeling you get when you see like a charge sheet with yeah. your name and then murder next to it, it's, it's, it's different. Um, and you know, we had been talking, the CID agent mm -hmm. and I had been talking for like 10 minutes before he even slid it over at me. You know, and I'm just like, well, wow, you know, like, yeah. um, and then I did, uh, you know, I got combative at that point, uh, you know, he's, you know, because he comes at me, you know, I'm going to get all your guys too, and I'm like, nope, I'm just going to change my statement, so I did it, and he's like, well, I'm going to hit you up for perjury because you mm. lied, and I'm like, dude, you're trying to charge me with murder, what's lying on top of it, you know, like, right, right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, and that that was the kicker was. You know, we were in a very isolated area. We didn't have good connectivity to everybody. So if things ch were changing, it wasn't getting passed down to us. Um, and that was, that was uh, a big issue with, you know, my, you know, the engagement I had because under that, uh, the RE we were under, that was engagement criteria. You know, two people speaking over radio uh, and I, you know, I even I made sure I called the boss, mm -hmm. got the clear, and then engaged, you know, and then, like I said, we get back, we get picked up, we get taken to squadron, and then there's a murder charge in right. front of you, and you're just like, whoa. Yeah, um, not, uh, not anticipating that. Yeah, I mean, and, and I, I get it, uh, you know, looking back at it analytically now, mm -hmm. if you just look at everything that happened that summer with the, the Robert Bales, and then that, and then... There was the, a lot going on. Oh, yeah, there's summer. a whole yeah. lot going on in the summer 2012, so, um, you know, I get it. 
you know, you want to have that due diligence and that that make sure everything gets looked into so there were no improprieties, you know. So, but I mean, it was it was very very nerve wracking. Um, it's because you know you're trying to get an attorney. You're in the middle of Afghanistan. You know, like it, it just it was crazy. Yeah. So what what were the next things that happened after that? Once you did get home. Well, we were all isolated still. Um, like we were under a gag order. We mm. weren't we weren't supposed to talk to each other. Uh, but let's face it, after duty. Sure. You know. Yeah. Like, you're gonna you're gonna start talking. Yeah. About, yeah you're you gonna know. start talking to each other. Um, but they they kept a, they kept, you know they kept the platoon separated. You know, guys started getting out or, or moving to other you know military installations and. You know, so there was just a few of us left, um, but 473 went away mm -hmm. and became 2nd Bat 501st um, when they shut down our brigade combat team. Uh, and there were four of us that were still left in the battalion, which was a problem because the investigation is still undergoing. Um, you know, like we should have been moved out yeah. and it didn't happen. So, you know, we had chain of command that would sit there and you know, talk to other junior leaders about, hey, whatever you do, don't end up like Lawrence. You know, look at what these guys mm -hmm. did. And it was, it was just a really bad working environment. Was there a moment you thought you'd go to prison? Oh yeah, for a couple months, you know, I was just waiting for it. Um, and then I got the, you know, letter of reprimand, mm -hmm. you know, and they were just like, hey, it's done. Um, you know, and I figured the investigation was done. They found that there was nothing improper and that, you know, uh, Everything was, you know, it was, it was a legitimate engagement. I gotcha. So, Paul, when we think about what Mike went through, Clint being in prison, when you think about these guys actually getting reprimanded, because this was a major, major statement. So, what were some of the most interesting parts of that part of the DACA series for you? Well, you know, part of it, a lot of these true crime series, you know, have, you know, various, um, you know, for lack of a better term, gimmicks and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And, and look, you know, the reveals at the end, you, you, you want, your audience to stick around. Um, so, you know, that, that's part of it and the placement of it. But, you know, it really, you know, we're lucky that a lot of these, you know, very big reveals, um, you know, fell as a part in the story that kind of coincided with our episodes. Um, yeah, look, it's, it just kind of speaks to the fact that, like, everything you think you know uh, isn't necessarily true and you right. just don't know what to think. There's so many sides to all these stories that, you know, it all factors in, and again, being responsible about the filmmaking, you just want to put everything in so uh, the audience can have context to you know whatever their decision-making process is and where, wherever they're going to fall. Totally. So, Mike, you've obviously thought about it day in and day out with what you went through. We then hear from the people in Afghanistan and the people that you were looking dead in the eye. Yep. How, how did you deal with that? If you know, I don't want to pry too much. Oh but no, what, what I mean, was that like for you? That's the thing. Um, I think it was important. Um, you know, that they did go out and talk to them, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it, it's important, you know, they have a, a huge, this is their country, we're there, you know, we're occupying, so I mean, they're, th th that's the important voice in all this, really, um, and I'm, I'm glad to see they're okay, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Afghanistan's one of those tricky spots to, to go to war with, like, you really don't know who's who. Um, and you're going to work with people who were Taliban or who still might be like that's just the nature of the game there unfortunately um, You know, so I mean it was it was Kind of nerve, you know nerve-wracking sure. to see him out, you know on, on TV, yeah. you know, and it's just like wow um, But you know, I'm, I'm glad they're all right if that counts for anything sure. uh, you know, but I mean, it was it was different. Yeah, yeah. you're certainly <laughs> never expecting that. Yeah, it's probably a very rare situation that you would ever even hear from the people on the other side, right? Yeah, that just yeah, goes to show yeah. the great work you guys did. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so yeah. when we think about the military in general, like you have Clint's mom saying, like, I don't want if you have a son, like, don't don't send him over. You've thought about your service and really questioned a lot of things. What should we think about our men and women in service? Because it's very much something that's politicized all the time. How do we have nuance to this conversation to say, like, there are many different parts to service? Paul, why don't we start with you, just in terms of filmmaking perspective? Oh, yeah. Look, I, I think, you know, uh, we're trying to lead by example by the choices that we made, you know, with this. Uh, I think, unfortunately, people kind of retreat to their own camps and stay uh, entrenched in those things. You know, our hope was to say, look, you know, all, there are a lot of perspectives on these things. And again, you know, I think people fall back and say, oh, it's the platoon versus Clint. Mm -hmm. And look, people are completely disregarding that other voice, which, uh, you know, the, the Afghans, as you right. just brought up. Um, so, 
you know, my, my hope is that, you know, people will look at this and, and be informed, you know. I mean, that's my hope. I, I don't know, you know. From early responses, people are kind of retreating to their own camps and their own uh, preconceptions. But, um, you know, having all the voices in there, again, was responsible, was essential, and hopefully it plays out to encourage people to have uh, substantive debate and respectful debate and actually talk about it. Because, look, you know, there, you know there, there's a lot going on beyond just the, spec the specific story that we're dealing with. It, there's a ripple effect that really applies to uh, other things associated with the war and the sure. people who are, uh, you know, affected by it. Definitely. So, Mike, how do you think about your time? I'm proud of the people I got to serve with. Like that's that's what I take away most uh, from it is I got to meet some great people and, and get to know and, and become a family with these great people, um, you know. But I have never been comfortable with like the veneration for uh, that we have for service members and yeah. Veterans. I was gonna say what what bothers you the most about that whole situation? I mean, it's uh, you know honestly, there's nothing more uncomfortable when someone comes up and says like thank you for your service mm. because you don't know how to react the right, right. way. Um, but you know, a, lo a lot of guys like me are just, you know what, you're welcome, or you know, thank you. And, uh, but you know, we're just normal people, you know, doing this really weird job. And that's when you get down to it, that's what it mm -hmm. is. Um, you know, and I get it, for some people it might be a calling. You know, it's like the family thing. Sure. My, my father and my grandfather served, and I understand that. But, you know, we're just people that are trying to figure things out as we go, based on, uh, you know, guidance from people that we're, we hardly ever see, but they're really in charge of us, you know, it's, uh, and the thing is, this isn't like working in, you know, like a, a bank or anything, like you don't see the CEO, right. yeah. but his decisions aren't going, po going to possibly get you killed, mm. you know, so I mean, it's, it's, it's really different, um, and I think that we did the best we could uh, under those conditions, but I mean, I have children and I would strongly recommend to my kids to not put a uniform on. Um, I don't feel we really, as a country, we don't really think before we try to apply that military force. And mm -hmm. We really need to start doing that. Uh, otherwise, we'll have more Iraqs, and yeah. you know. And I, I don't think anybody wants that. Yeah, no question. Yeah, about if, it. I, if I could add, just sure. and, and some of what we, you know, want to accomplish. Look, your your highest ideals are to okay make a change, and you know, perhaps people look at this and in, in, inform the decision makers will hopefully look at it and kind of help make it inform some of their decisions about what to do with our service members. And look, you know, that's a very, very high ideal and a high aspiration for somebody who's just putting together a little film and a little story, but, you know, the, the power of these things, you, you hope to uh, make an impact uh, beyond just telling an entertaining and compelling story. I think that's the perfect place to leave it. Paul, hey, thanks. thank you very much, Mike. Thank Good you. to meet you. Oh. October 20th, if you don't want to miss it, five-part docuseries. For Paul and Mike, I'm DJ. See you next time here on The Sit Down.